Okay, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, I'd like to uh, give a hearty welcome to all our students, faculty, staff, and alumni attendees. Uh, I'm Al Pisano, the Dean of the Jacobs School of Engineering. Uh, I give you my personal welcome, uh, and I offer uh, uh, c apologies that uh, Bob Sullivan, the Dean of the Rady School, was unable to, was unable to be here uh, tonight. Uh, from the engineering school perspective, I offer that one of the governing mantras that uh, we use in engineering is that the great engineering schools of the next decade will collaborate their way to relevance. And what that means is we are taking partners uh, all around the campus. And at this event, we're celebrating the partnership uh, between the Rady School of Management and the Jacobs School of Engineering in the way of their joint effort, the uh, Institute for the Global Entrepreneur. Now, tonight's event is a perfect example about how that kind of collaboration can mirror true, real world industry scenarios uh, and show how you can build interesting career options for graduating UC San Diego students, both in engineering and in business. So uh, to take a short sojourn through a short history lesson, uh, in 2016, uh, Dean Sullivan and I launched that Institute for the Global Entrepreneur, and it was specifically created to inspire and prepare engineers to be entrepreneurial leaders and to translate technology inventions from the lab to the marketplace so that our two schools could work together to fuel the economy and benefit society. And these are the other two themes that uh, uh, we share between uh, radiant engineering, the whole idea that uh, we are relevant uh, to the community around us and to the economic health of the country. So it's uh, of particular excitement and interest is uh, our certificate program uh, for Jacob School master students and PhD students uh, to be able to work hand in hand with Rady students. And it's the Technology Management and Entrepreneurism Certificate. Uh, that program is designed to help students gain business acumen, build ventures, and to improve their career preparedness by mixing the two communities and having each other teach the other about themselves, putting together Jacob School and Rady School people. And I can assure you, more and more and more uh, engineering companies are asking me for engineers who have business acumen, and more and more and more business-oriented corporations are asking for business people who have experience with the technology. So we are gonna be relevant, we're gonna fill that need, and if there are any of the students in the audience tonight thinking about that program, I strongly encourage you to take a, a good look at it. Um, we have with us two wonderful alums. Uh, I had a, a wonderful hour, uh, 45 minutes with them earlier today. Uh, and these two people really underscore the opportunity for success where you start with an engineering background and then you move into business and finance. So uh, each of them have, uh, have been empowered by a set of engineering tools, ways to take apart and reassemble and solve problems, yet they've surplanted their engineering experience by branching off into uh, very non-engineering uh, professions. And indeed, uh, we in engineering see this as a growing trend, that the engineering toolkit is a useful toolkit for a wide variety of professions. Um, uh, I think they, uh, I know one for sure, I think they each supplanted their engineering education with an MBA, right? Uh, yes, on both counts, okay, excellent. Um, and of course, they entered the world of finance and investment, and that's why it's the Engineering Investors uh, Conference that, uh, seminar that we're having right now. So uh, let's get ready to launch that fireside chat. What I'd like to do now is shift and introduce our moderator, Michael Melvin, uh, the, uh, your far right. Uh, he is the executive director 
of the Master of Finance program at the Rady School of Management. Uh, Michael is an expert on the subject matter of investments and international finance. Um, I'll have to ask your advice about my personal portfolio because mine's in the tank. Um, the, uh, that's why I'm still working for a living. Um, uh, he received his PhD in economics from UCLA. Uh, he's held teaching positions at Northwestern, Arizona State, UCLA, UC Berkeley, and now UC San Diego, as well as research positions within the industry, uh, serving at BlackRock and at Barclays. Uh, Michael, I want to thank you very, very much for leading this discussion tonight. Uh, and uh, now I will turn the proceedings over to you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. It's, it's great. No, you're supposed to clap after I show I can demount the podium <laughs> without tripping. Huh. I want to second what the dean said about uh, engineers and people from different fields moving into business, like in the Master of Finance program. We love engineers, we love UCSD undergrads, don't have enough of them, and we want a lot more because they can do wonderful things. I mean, look at these two next to me. So we have, I, I want to introduce both of them. We have uh, on my far right, Paul Timby, class of 88, and right next to me, Greg Warner, class of 87. Does that mean you're one year older than he is? We were really both supposed to graduate in 86. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you couldn't get enough. That one. Who's the knucklehead up here? Couldn't get enough yeah, knowledge. Yeah, so yeah. so uh, it, it's really interesting to, to hear about their story, how their career has gone. How did they go from engineering graduate, with honors, I'll add, for both of them. So these guys, you know, great guys, but they were very serious students and graduated with high honors. So they, they, did, they did wonderfully well here at UCSD. And I want to hear, and I hope you want to hear about their careers. How did they move from engineering at UCSD? They went for an MBA somewhere on the East Coast. There was no Rady School of Management at that time, of course. So uh, this was years ago. And uh, then they moved into the finance industry. So we want to learn about them. But uh, Paul has recently retired. He was a partner and portfolio manager at Dowling & Yankee here in San Diego, wealth management firm. And uh, Greg is still at it. He's the president of Ingleside Investors in New York City. And they've had really fascinating careers. And I'm really looking forward to hearing their story. And this is, this is what's so valuable, to have people like these come to campus and talk about how did they go from UCSD to where they are now and the path that they took, and we're gonna hopefully learn a lot from this. I'm, I'm sure we will. But I'd actually like to just start just hearing what's a special memory of UCSD from your student years that you can repeat in public <laughs> to, uh, what, what do you recall? It is not time? about me. You could say mm -hmm. whatever, but you can't Most talk about Most of everything me. I'm gonna do is talk about you, but you yeah. go next. <laughs> uh, you go we're first. talking about this earlier. Can, 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 can everybody, people hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay? volume's okay? Up there, way up in the back. That's where everybody's sitting, way up in the back. It's like business school. There's like <laughs> not a lot of people sitting right here. Um, you know, I was thinking about it. I gave a different answer earlier. I, Paul and I had a house on Coast Boulevard in Del Mar for two years, the last couple of years. And it was right, on, right off the beach. And I was down there today, and I was walking on the beach. And I, I think that was probably my best memory was being there on the beach and commuting to school along Torrey Pines Road. And that, that was good stuff. Yeah, I'll share a, an on-campus exp uh, experience. Uh, Greg and I were roommates the very first year we got here. Uh, if, if you know the dorms around here, there's Argo Hall is a six-story building up on Ravel campus. There's a big plaza out in front. And we uh, thought it would be a good idea to go out in the first uh, couple of days we got onto campus and paint our dorm walls with glossy black and glossy white checkerboard pattern, they're, they're cinder blocks. So w when you see it from down below in the quad, it looks like a checkerboard up there. And we thought we were pretty special at the time because anybody would say, where do you live? And we'd say, Argo Hall. And they'd say, oh, really? Sixth floor, you know the checkerboard room? Oh, that's where you live? And so that was our very first year of trying to, trying to be fancy, let's say. But it was a, it was a great oh, year, fancy. and uh, we had a lot, of good, a lot of good experiences right out of the gate. All right, thank you. So, All right, so we're done here. What's that? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm sure there are many other stories that can't be told. That can't be in this told. Venue, will not but, be told. Yeah. Uh, oh my God. We'll move on. So let's, let's do. All right. So let's hear both of you. Hear your story. Like, how did you go from UCSD engineer, and tell us about your career path from UCSD to where to where to where? 
what you, where you worked, where, where you went to school, of course, you went on for an MBA, where you worked, what you did, and also just why finance? You know, you guys had so many options available to you. Just why finance? So we'll start with Paul. Okay. So um, after UCSD, uh, I did engineering, mechanical engineering undergrad, and had a lot of international exposure as well. But I was really motivated to um, get into the engineering program uh, after I got back from my third year uh, abroad in Germany. And when you do the math, I did the engineering program in three years. That's why I'm so long on campus. But I, I did enjoy every year. My parents didn't enjoy the cost, but I did enjoy every year. It was like um, $600 a year back then. Yeah. Yeah, the like, beer was more expensive than the tuition. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> so I finished UCSD, and I actually got a couple of jobs, uh, a year in France and a year in Belgium, where I studied international business. The other one, I worked in a plastics manufacturing facility. So with an engineering background, I was able to kind of get to places that may not have been as easy to get if I ha didn't have a, uh, a relatively technical degree. So uh, part of what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what is it like to be an engineer? in the real world, and what is it like to be a finance person in the real world, and what, is, what are your personality types, who fits in which zone, or you know, do, can you fit in both, and mo a lot of people can, obviously. Uh, long story short, after two years of being abroad, I came back to the United States, worked two years in a facility that made parts for nuclear reactors, and if I'm glowing, you know why. Um, the bottom line is we made parts for the nuclear reactor that held the um, radioactive material, but we didn't have any radioactive material anywhere near us. That was two years, and I got to go to Japan, France, Germany, Mexico, and that was really fun. I enjoyed the engineering work. I was a quality assurance engineer. I got to go over to Japan, open up crates when they'd take out these, uh, uh, the, the tubes, basically, and at the end, we'd have big celebra celebratory dinners and that sort of thing. Uh, after that, I worked for two, four years at a company that made parts for irrigation uh, components like parks and gardens. You, you've probably got them at your house or wherever you live, those types of sprinklers. And that was fun because I got to travel as an engineer and as a product manager and also as a salesperson through different roles. And I was overseas a lot as well. But the next part, what happened was I started studying finance and started studying the markets. And I became very, very, very passionate about stocks, bonds, you know, economic history, why, why did the crash of 1929 happen the way it did? How did that lead into, or did it not lead into the Depression? What happened in 1973, 74? Why was there an oil embargo? How did, prices, how did price restriction impact the ability to get or not get gasoline? You know, all that stuff I found really fascinating. And I was working at a day job being an engineer, but in the evenings and weekends, I was studying, studying, studying. Um, I decided I'd go to, the, to grad school, took the GMAT, and at the time, I, would have, I was about 31 years old when I took the GMAT. And this is free, free advice. If you're going to go to MBA school, study very hard for the GMAT, because the GMAT will, can make you stand out. Uh, and it's one of the very big measuring points that they're going to use. So if you're considering it and you want to go to a school um, that is demanding, study really hard for your GMAT. Uh, finally, I went to Wharton, which you'll find in a minute is sort of interesting. Uh, I went to Wharton for my MBA. And when I came back from uh, Philadelphia, uh, my wife and I were living in Baltimore for a short period of time, and I decided that Baltimore was not a place for me. I didn't fit in. I hung out in New York for a bit, and you'll learn about New York here in a minute, um, and I found that I wasn't going to fit there either. So another thing that was important to me was I was able to look in the mirror and say, you know, you may think you're special, but you're not so special, and you need to you're fit special. in. Thank you. That, you know, <laughs> that's why he's my buddy. He's but, special. But, but, <laughs> that's right. So. The, the point is sometimes if everybody else is doing X, sometimes you need to do Z or Y or A. Um, and keep that in mind too because your friends, some of you are going to have friends that are going to get a job like that and other people are going to get jobs and it's going to be like the last person who gets a job is the biggest loser. Well, that was me when I left MBA school. I, all of my buddies had, had jobs and it's because they had traditional careers. They went to New York, they took a signing bonus and they were miserable. But um, afterward, because they were like getting killed, but they, they kind of wanted to do what everybody else was doing, and it wasn't necessarily what was right for them. Um, back to me, uh, I, I decided I wanted to be in San Diego. My wife and I said, let's not live in Baltimore. Let's live in San Diego. And I basically had to go on my own. Of the 750 people in my MBA class, one person went to San Diego, and that was me. And so I was kind of off the beaten track. But long story short, I was here for 20 years doing finance with individuals. I loved it. I've got some uh, colleagues in the audience back over there who were kind enough to join us today. But uh, the, my opening remarks are basically, um, 
be, be true to yourself, focus on what's important to you, and follow that path. Uh, and later on, we're going to talk about some other things that are more down in the weeds and stuff. But I would say, if, if you do want to not be an engineer all your life, and you do want to do an MBA, um, take it very, very seriously. It's like, like getting another job. And we'll talk about that more. Oh, and I just retired, May 25th. So it's been almost a year since I've retired. And I, this isn't part of the program, but I just finished making my tickets for my Spain trip, where I'm going to be for six weeks, starting on like May something or March something. So I've now got the ability to have some free time and follow a lot of passions that I have. See, you're special. Thank you. Isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> That was a really long answer. It was long. I'll try not to be so long. Um, I, sort of one of my themes of, of you know, thinking about careers is I, not, nothing that happened to me was planned. When I, so right now, I've been at the same firm for 21 years. I think you were at Downing for about 20. Um, I've had three jobs in my life. Um, and I, I did, didn't sort of foresee any of them. But at the place I work now, I, I got the job at a... I had a family office doing private equity investing. Now, you guys might know what that means, but I didn't know what any of that meant. And I certainly didn't even know it existed when I was at UC San Diego. I'd never had any exposure to, to what I do now. So my career just kind of happened to me. I think I was well prepared as, as luck you know, had its way. And I did study really hard, except I didn't wait till I was 40 or whatever right. you were. I did it when I was like right coming out of school. I studied for the GMAT because I was still in test mode. Right. Yeah, so that was good. There's something to be said for that. Um, so the only thing I think I planned was that maybe I would go to business school someday. That was, that was one thing that I planned. But at, when I was at, um, at UC San Diego, when I got here, I didn't know what to major in, but my parents had both been math majors, so I did that. And my dad was a businessman, so I had some sense that maybe someday I wanted to be a businessman, but that was about, that was about the whole of it. Um, and then when we start to get to like fourth, fifth dimensions in math, I was like, what are we even talking about? That doesn't make any sense to me. So that's when I became an engineering major because it just made a lot more sense. Like gravity, I get that, but like sixth dimension math, just it didn't didn't uh, didn't grab me. So so I think maybe freshman year or sophomore year I became a, an engineering major, and I loved it. I just loved I loved everything about it. I loved my professors. I loved the problem solving. I I thought it was just the best, and I figured I'm going to go be an engineer. And then I started to date this older woman. She was a senior, and I was a junior, I think. And she said, you know, I work at IBM. Senior citizen, by the way. <laughs> Debbie Tippett. So she was a senior, and she had a job, like a real job. She worked at IBM here in San Diego doing, um, in, a, in their marketing office. And she said, you know, you should take my job when I leave. I was like, okay. So all of a sudden, I have a job at IBM, and I wear a suit to school, and my all my buddies, including you, would take my business cards and hand them out at happy hour. They thought that was really funny. <laughs> but it kind of got me in a mode of you know, wearing a suit and working. And so I did that for a while. And then when I graduated, it was really a tough time to get a job because there was a recession, I think, in 87, if I recall. And um, uh, I, I did go to New York. I thought, you know, maybe I'll go be an investment banker. That looks like a really cool job. And I did some interviewing. But my dad said, you know what? Learn to sell. Like, that's a real uh, skill that will carry you in all kinds of things. And I, I didn't used to listen to my dad a whole lot, but that made some sense to me. And so I actually took a job in sales with IBM coming out of school in, in, in LA. Went to IBM sales school, and I thought, this is a great job because I get to see all these different businesses and learn about these different businesses. But what it didn't have was any of the engineering problem-solving fun stuff that I had liked. And it was hard. Like, selling is really hard. And so that's when I decided I would go to business school to try to change my career path. I went to business school. I will say, McKinsey and Company at the time had written a book called In Search of Excellence, so I knew a little bit about them. And I kind of wanted to get a job at McKinsey and Company, the, the international consulting firm, but I didn't think there was a chance that I'd be able to do that. But when I was at uh, Wharton, which is, I also went to Wharton, they came and recruited on campus, and I got really lucky, and I got a summer job, really lucky. Like, it was a plum job, and um, I don't know how I got it, but I got it, to come back and work for McKinsey and in uh, their LA office. Still no finance. I mean, there's no, I had no plan to be a, a finance person. But along the way, I started to consult the banks. And I went to Hong Kong with McKinsey. And then all the banks were really in New York. And the cool stuff was happening in New York. And so about 26, 27 years ago, I moved to New York. And then, you know, you know I was just kind of in that world. And this guy who had been a client of mine at a bank said, you should go talk to this family office, which family offices are 
offices for super wealthy people to manage just their money. You should go talk, but I didn't know that at the time. It didn't really mean anything to me. You should go talk to this family office. They have a guy who's doing private equity investing. Private equity investing really just means investing in the, the equity ownership of companies that aren't public. They're private companies, but I didn't really know what that meant either. And it was, it just kind of was dumb luck that I ended up getting this job and I figured I would do it for two years. And 21 years later, I'm still there and I now run the firm and we invest in all kinds of crazy things like timberland in China and oil and gas and Texas. And we own a dog food company and a steel company. And um, so it's been, a, it's been a really great ride, but I, it, it wasn't my plan. That, and I, that's, that's one message I give is like, you, you have no idea what jobs are going to be out there in 10 years or 20 years. Or, so don't, don't plan too hard. You know, just be ready when opportunities come along and, and, you know, be ready to take advantage of them. Yeah, I think that's great advice. By the way, at the end, uh, we're going to have Q&A, and you'll be able to submit questions electronically to me from your phone or your, your tablet. So, you know, if, you have, if you're thinking of questions, which I hope you are, you'll be able to submit them. So I can pose the question. Rather than have you raising your hands and passing a microphone around, it's, uh, it's more efficient to do it this way. Do you way. need to tell them how to do that? It's, oh, in, we it's in the program. We so in it's the program coming. are some instructions if you want to submit questions on, on your iPhone, right, Zach? Yeah. And the name of the program is, or the app it's is? It's on there. It's Swipe. In there. Slido. Yeah. There you go. All right. OK. Is so, it there now? No. Yeah, it's, you, it thank is. you for reminding me. So you were a wealth manager. Mm -hmm. What's that? And what did you do? Literally, yeah. what was your job? OK. So. Who's interested in finance for, their, for some time down the road or interested in getting an MBA? Okay. Or maybe or, getting or a an Master MBA. of Finance. Or a Master of Finance, yeah. No, nobody's interested in that. <laughs> what is that even? That's, that's Rady speak. So um, what I did for a living was basically, wealth management is basically the idea of, there's a whole bunch of different areas of wealth management. What I personally did here in San Diego was work with individual families, generally an older woman and an older man who had kids that were out of college, who had several million dollars that they'd saved and invested over time who wanted someone else to take the hassle out of their, out of their lives and manage that money for them. Uh, generally speaking, we got paid to help them understand how much risk they were taking, how much we were charging them to do that job, and then help them understand that there's going to be happy times and bad times. And when the bad times come, often you need to actually be buying the risky stuff. And when the happy times come, you have to actually reduce your, your stocks and that sort of thing. So it was uh, the first thing that I learned early on was actually the ability to deal with people's emotions was critical in wealth management. If you're talking to a person who doesn't understand how the stock market works, who thinks that the Wall Street Journal is in, written in Chinese, if, excuse me if you speak Chinese, but long story short, if, if the it type is, of, by the way, they have, the, well, they have oh, a Chinese true. version. That's right. Yeah. Long story the short, if the, the people we dealt with were absolutely incapable generally of doing it on their own. So my world was very much a teacher, mentor sort of role. Greg's life was very different. And so the two of us are very complementary today for different aspects of fi finance. And we'll talk about some other types of finance out there. But wealth management for me was, it was fantastic because I was able to deal with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, gain their trust. And that, it wasn't like gaining their trust by cheating them or doing something you know, underhanded, it was actually being honest and being straightforward and telling the truth and being very transparent and always saying, this is how we're getting paid. This is how we're not getting paid. This is what we can control. This is what we cannot control. And we, if you want to be in a world where you never have to be worried about your reputation, dealing with clients face to face and being responsible for everything you promise and everything you deliver, it's a great job. And it's, it was great for me. I did it for 20 years. Um, and so it's basically understanding how stocks work how international stocks work, how emerging market stock work. Uh, it's understanding fixed income, risks in fixed income. Uh, things like if you get excited about Bitcoin, you may not want to deal with clients because Bitcoin, my guess is it's not going to be here in 20 years. But those of you who are laughing inside, you know, you're welcome to laugh. The point being that when you're dealing with other people's money, you got to make sure you don't lose money for them. But the market's going to do what it does, and you have to be willing to say, I know I don't know what the market's going to do, but I do also know that you need to take this amount of risk because you need to spend this amount of money per year. Ooh, that could have been an earthquake. That's you popping your mic. Okay. Oh, yeah. So anyway, so that's, that's wealth management on an individual basis with, with clients. Okay. 
But what do you do like day, day in and day out? Day to day, we would do a security selection. We do trading. Uh, that means buying and selling securities, mutual funds, uh, acquiring bonds for clients. Um, we would have investment committee meetings. We talk about um, where's the yield curve today relative to where it was in the last, you know, 20 years, 10 years, uh, what do we think is, are bonds expensive or cheap? Are people freaking out because there's a woman named Meredith Whitney in 2010, she predicted the, the, the end of municipal bonds basically, and it, it, sh it sent shivers through the marketplace for about two weeks, and it was a golden opportunity to acquire muni bonds for clients who needed those. If they didn't need them, we didn't buy them, but it was, it, we spent quite a bit of time being in tune with the market, but a big part of our life was just dealing with clients uh, face to face, and another big part, you talked about selling, technically I was also a salesman. I was selling our product or service. I was telling the client how we solved their problem, how we charged, how our solution solved their problem, and showing them uh, that they have alternatives. They can go over to competitor A, B, or C. Here's what makes us good. Here's what makes the competitors good or not good. And then we also inform them, so I have what's called a CFA designation. If you're into in investment management, CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst, is something you should know about. I learned about it only when I got to Wharton because there were a bunch of people who already knew a lot more about it than I did, and they all had their CFA designation. And I thought, hmm, that, that's exactly what I want to do for a living, but I don't know what the CFA thing is. So Chartered Financial Analyst is a deep dive. It's like an MBA program on investments. Um, the CFP, Certified Financial Planner, is for the ability to help people understand their retirement analysis. Uh, if you have a million dollars, you can spend maybe $30,000, $40,000 a year. You can't spend $100,000 a year, or you're going to run out of money. Uh, sometimes being an advisor is basically telling people what they don't want to hear. You know, I had a, this is, well, I'm going to say it because I think it's funny. But I had one guy come into my office and I said, you know, you can try the Smith & Wesson retirement. When you run out of money, you take out your Smith & Wesson. Now, I thought it was funny, but I don't think they did. But the point was, sometimes people come into your office and they have no chance of doing what they think they're going to do. And you have to tell them, you, you, you're not even close to being able to do what you're talking about. You're, you're delusional. You're not going to get 10% on a safe portfolio. Maybe you get 10% on a risky portfolio. So a lot of it was being very, very, very brutally honest. Um, and so that's, that was kind of the day-to-day -day job. But there was a sales component, selling a service. There was the hand-holding and being a psychologist and a teacher. And then there was the day-to-day, -day, the technical stuff that some people really want to do all day. And I, I, I enjoyed the technical stuff, and I enjoyed the client face-to-face. -face. I think that it's, it's, it's really useful to point out at this point that these designations matter, MBA, CFA, you know, that uh, it, it, it's confidence-inspiring when you have teams that have that. And I know in, in our program, there's, there's a CFA course, elective course, preparing for the CFA, and it's hugely popular. And the students have done, have, we have a very high pass rate because of that. And I think this is so good that schools are now in, including this in the curriculum. Yeah, if I could jump on that. If you are serious about investment, or if even if you're not super, super convinced, but you're taking those classes, you should definitely take CFA 1, CFA 2, CFA 3. You may not know it, but there's three, pro, there's three years of study, and you take the test, you fail, you try again. But if you can take the coursework, then take the test, pass, take the coursework, pass, take the coursework, pass, or you might have to study on your own at the third year. But it's being spoon-fed the CFA material is almost like a gift from God. That's how I did it. When I got there, I was at Wharton. They said, to do the CFA exam, number one, you need to take this, 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 this course. By the time I finished my regular classes to get a grade, I was, I was more than halfway prepared for the exam. I was like three, three quarters of the way done. So if you're thinking about it, consider getting those types of courses that you're talking about. All right, let's turn to Greg. President, Ingleside Investors. What do you do? I have, so I'm pretty old now. So I'll, I'll talk about what I do now, and I'll also talk about what kind of the most junior people in my firm do, because that, that's probably more likely what you guys would be doing when you get out of school. You're probably not going to be doing what I do right away, because I've been doing this a long time. But I, I guess I have three or four jobs um, one is I run the firm. So every, we have 25 people that work for us. They all report to me. Um, they're responsible for keeping track of all the money and all the bank accounts and all the trusts and all the legal entities. And, um, so, so all those people report to me. I manage them. I deal with a lot, deal with a lot of drama. Uh, there's a lot of drama in managing people. So that's one, one part of my job. A second part of my job is we uh, farm money out to third-party managers like BlackRock or um, 
other firms that invest in other kinds of things. And that's almost like HR. It's like picking really good, talented people to manage money for us. So that's a second thing that I do. And I meet with people pretty much every day. I'm meeting with new people who are very good investors themselves. And we decide whether we want to give them some of our money for them to invest for us. And it's usually in things that we wouldn't be able to do for ourselves because there's a lot of stuff to invest in out there. And we certainly don't know how to invest in all of it. So that's a second job. A third job, really the one that I find the most fun and that takes up the most of my time is we buy and sell companies. And so it's, so we're constantly, we, we look at three or 400 companies every year to make direct investments into. Um, so we're constantly looking at new businesses that do new things and deciding which of them are attractive to invest in. And if they're attractive, then doing work to verify that what they tell us is true and you know, do all kinds of customer calls and things to make sure that the company's the kind of company we would want to own, and then then we'll buy those companies and typically sit on their boards and help the management teams grow the companies and make them more valuable, and hopefully, and then sell them. So I spend a lot of my time on that, and we have a couple people on, on my team that, that do the same. Um, and then there's like the, so I, this is a super wealthy family, but they have kids and grandkids, and I, I do get involved to some extent in their personal lives. You know, if somebody's going through a divorce, I'm right there helping them. If somebody's getting married, I might be helping them with that. If they're buying a new house, I'll help them with that. I mean, these are pretty sophisticated people, but, um, but I, I get involved in them, kind of helping the family too. So let's do step now to the entry level. So entry level with wealth management. You hire someone in the door, what do they do? What's their job? Yeah, so the, the sad thing for, for the wealth management industry is uh, you have two things against you if you're relatively young and new. Uh, it's brutal, but if you're under about 30, there's a credibility issue. Um, so the, the, typical, the typical entry level uh, position would be something in the neighborhood of either uh, back office work, meaning dealing with trades, dealing with paperwork, or um, uh, de dealing with, uh, you know, interfacing with uh, clients through their retirement analysis, for example. So you'd put together a retirement plan, and then the, the, what we call the team lead would be the person who presents that plan. As you get better and better, let's say you're 28 years old, you've been at the firm for three years, you're already, you know, you've been doing re retirement analyses many, many times, and it's crystal clear that you're very good at this. We would then you know, push for, uh, get more designations, get more background, get more information so that you can sit in front of clients. Um, the, 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 the move from uh, first seat to second seat is usually very doable for most people, but if you really, really, really want to be the person who's dealing with the client face-to-face, -face, it's very, very important to have both designations and a little bit of age and maturity, and basically the ability to look at somebody straight in the eye and say, you know, you're not going to make it with the money you've got. And it's, it's sometimes it's intimidating when you've got a 70 or 80-year-old gentleman sitting in front of you who's made a plan that's going to work in his mind, and you're telling him, your dreams are not going to work. Because either they're going to be not good, they're not going to be your client. But that's not what a junior person's doing. No, no. I'm just trying to get from the, from yeah. the small to the, to the uh, kind of the steps through the business. Because there's, um, generally speaking, the, the, uh, in wealth management, the, there's, um, because you're basically dealing with very high-end people, there's very little communication between the entry-level person and the actual end client. So it's... So the idea there is if you have other experience in finance before that, then you prove that you're willing and ready to sit in front of a client. And that's where that age comes in. Once you're about 30-ish years old, um, clients who have you know, several million dollars will start to respect your input. But it's, it's a ripoff. If, you, if you're 25 years old and you know you're a good person, in face-to-face -face wealth management, uh, there's a bias out there by these older people or even people who have the three or four million bucks they don't, they don't want you to learn how to do it on their money. And that's, that's, that's the hard truth. What about at uh, Ingleside? What, what's an entry-level job? What do they do? So in the investment part of our business, an, ent an entry-level person does whatever we tell them to do, kind of. I mean, not, not to be um, snarky, but it, you know, we, um, the investment business, kind of to pick it up on Paul's point, so much of becoming a, a good investor, which means knowing how to make appropriate risk-adjusted returns. I mean, you know kind of what risk you're taking and how likely you are to lose money and are you going to make enough money to, to, to justify that risk. That's experience. And there's no amount of like reading a book 
or um, taking a class that's going to make you good at that. And so you're, our, our junior people are not, they're not making investment decisions, that's for sure. I mean, we make investment decisions as a team, but they're not, they don't, they don't have any authority to, to invest our money. But it's, it's more like we see 300 companies. So your job, new guy, is, or girl, is you keep track of all those and make sure that if we're supposed to get back to somebody, we get back to them. And if we're supposed to do a certain analysis on their customer base, that that analysis gets done. And you might do it, um, but that's the kind of work that our, and these, these aren't new people out of college. These are people that have some, some experience already. But it's, you know, being in the investment business, that, that's, Paul and I are really in the investment business. There are all kinds of finance careers that aren't in the investment business. Um, a lot of it is, is just learning through doing and seeing and making mistakes and hopefully not so bad that you blew up your firm and you're done forever, but you, you, that's how you learn. So junior people are doing, they're doing a lot of spreadsheets. They're doing a lot of, like I said, keeping track of things. Um, you know, we have a, uh, for us, we have a, a customer relationship management system called Salesforce. Maybe you guys have heard of Salesforce, where we keep track of all of our relationships and keep all that up to date. And that's, that's what the entry level people are doing. They're, they're maintaining those systems for us. So what if you now take a, a retrospective view of your career? If I say, if you had it to do over again, what would you do differently? What would you say, Paul? Well, for me, it worked out pretty good, so I, I wouldn't change a whole lot. Um, I will. I, I guess to answer that question, the, the one thing I thought, I, I, I actually thought I'd be an engineer for life. I thought I was going to go off to Europe and live there for the rest of my life. Um, so f from my initial plan, when I finished engineering at UCSD, I thought I was going to be in France for the first year in that job, and then I was going to Belgium for my international, international business degree in Belgium, and I thought I'd live in Europe for the rest of my life because of my background, because I lived in Germany, France, Belgium, et cetera, and Spain as a kid. So I had a lot of European stuff going on. But um, as it turned out, I, my wife, I decided to stay here. Um, and so there's so many things that happened perfectly for me. Like, it just, I got lucky. I think Greg said it too a little bit. I mean, I didn't, I didn't expect things to work out the way they did, but I would say that the one thing that was really, really good when I r finished my MBA, I talked to a tremendous amount of people, and I think I already mentioned it. I basically said, I don't want to do what everybody else wants to do. I want to do what I want to do, and I'm going to focus on that. And it may take me six months while everybody else has already got their job and their signing bonus and they're all happy. At least, hopefully, one day I'm going to look back and say, I got to live in San Diego doing exactly what I wanted to do, and I lived there for you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and had a career that was super fun, and all of us were happy in San Diego. And, and so the, I, I know the question, but there, for me, I feel so lucky the way it turned out. I have zero complaints, and there's nothing I'd change. I, I do have, if the question comes up, there are other things I'm going to be doing with my life. Retirement doesn't mean sitting around, but um, I felt that I'd spent a, a good portion of my life doing a few things very, very well, but there's a lot of other things that I really, really are, am interested in spending the, the rest of my life doing. And you don't necessarily have to work or make money to do something that you love, or you, if you do love something that you get paid for, that's great too. Uh, but um, uh, I wouldn't change a thing. Greg? I would have taken three years off like Paul did and go to Europe in the middle of college. <laughs> that's what I would have done. I watched him do that while I was grinding away at, at the cent what was Central Library, now Geisel Library. Um, no, I, I, that's a hard question to answer because you never know, you know, had I done this, what path life might have taken, and I'm pretty happy with my life. I, I might ask, answer a question you didn't ask, which is if I could go back and tell myself stuff. Because, you know, I, I, along my life I've thought, if I could have shown myself a movie 10 years ago of what my life was going to be today, like what would I have thought of that? And, would, and usually it would have been like, how did you get there? Like that's, that would usually have been the answer to that. How did you get there? Like there's no path from where I was there to there that I could uh, imagine. So I, I think if I were to go back and sort of talk to myself as a freshman, sophomore, junior at um, UC San Diego, I, I would have said, um, you have no idea what's what's going to in store for you. You have no idea. Just um, build really good skills that are durable that no matter what career you're in, you can use. 
Um, chill out. Chill out. Enjoy life. Like, this is the only one you got. And the answer isn't, like, what job you're going to have in 30 years. It's, like, enjoy what you're doing now. I'm not a big believer in, you know, pursuing my passion, but, like, whatever you're doing, have passion for it, and things will turn out. Those are the, those are, have been the kinds of things I would have told myself if I could go back in a time machine. Because I was pretty stressed, you know. What I, I was an ambitious guy, and I wanted all these <laughs> things to work out, and I think I should have chilled out. Yeah, easy to say now. Easy to say. All this stuff's yeah. easy to say now. But, but you, you came here, and you didn't know what you wanted to major in. You told us. No, so. I didn't. What about you, Paul? Did you come I was saying, I want to be an engineer? Too. No, I, I showed up un undeclared, and it uh, took me, like I said, three years before I figured it out. And so my fourth year, I started engineering seriously. But it, I, had, I kind of had an epiphany one day when I was in the middle of Germany. I came home, and I was sitting with my, talking to my sister, and she said, you know what you're good at is things like engineering. And I thought, you know, you're pretty right about that. Yeah. And I looked into it, and I said, oh, wow, I'm way behind the curve, but I'm going to do it. So I was undeclared. I didn't know what I was going to do. But w once I got into it, it was, it's not quite as good as that, but it was sort of like eating dessert for dinner. Once you get into your classes, and you're doing your major stuff, and you're doing work, um, that you really are interested in and fascinated by, it's, it, it's a lot more fun than breadth requirements to cover some course you'll never be interested in your life, right? So one, and the same thing at MBA school. When we started doing finance classes, uh, investment classes, everything they talked about was like, oh, I just could, I could sit here and listen to you for five more hours, but the class is only an hour and a half. Um, so it, um, the, the point there, um, well, the point is when you get into the areas that you're really fascinated and interested in, interested in it's a lot more fun. But, it, but it's true. It's easy to get stressed out um, because you're, the, the other thing is you're probably comparing yourself to all your buddies. He's got a better grade. He got a better job. He's got a prettier... No, no, that was you comparing yourself to me That's through true. college. <laughs> That's true. And that he's, was all true. He's, he's got a prettier girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. I have to wash his car. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't do that, just so you know. Yeah. I wasn't, yeah. That was you doing yeah. that. So anyway, so that, that can all, all, also be a stress uh, inducer when you spend too much time comparing yourself because everybody's better than you at something and you're better than a lot of things that other people are poor at but you'll never remember you never say hey you know I dance really well and sing pretty good darn well but math everybody else is better at math or whatever your thing is you're great at some stuff and you're not that good at others focus on what's really what you're best at I think yeah why the MBA that wasn't and why finance it just happened for you because of the McKinsey no, no, I, I, so, so when I was at IBM in sales, I knew I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. Um, I, I liked aspects of it, but it wasn't the career I wanted to have. And, it, and it, it, that would have been a hard job to go get a totally different job. Like you, once you're a salesperson, you can get another sales job, but they're not going to make you head of a plant. Or, and I wanted to go do something different. So, so for me, business school represented an opportunity to really kind of just put behind everything I'd done in the past and put myself in a new uh, position. So it was very strategic and intentional when I went to business school. Did you specialize in finance in business school? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I wasn't passionate about finance. Um, it was just it was the Wharton School of Finance, and that was the yeah, best, best major. Yeah, the school. Yeah. Yeah. And for you, Paul, you developed this interest you told us about, that you were studying the markets you know, on your own time and, and got into it that way. Yeah, I would, I would tell people who are considering leaving engineering to go to some other portion of the business world. Uh, for me, I, uh, my resume s smelled like engineering a mile away and nothing about finance. I, I could talk about it, but I couldn't show it. And so one of the things I learned pretty quickly was I started doing interviews to see if I could get a job in finance, leaving my then job of the irrigation job and going directly into finance somehow. And the answer I got was, you can sell insurance or you can pick up the phone and smile and dial. And I said, well, that's not me. I, I want to do this very ethically, very well. I want to be known as somebody who's very good at what they do and is the top of their game. And they said, well, then you just need to go get your MBA and, and signal that you're really committed. So again, this is a freebie. There's something called credible commitment. And it means you've, you've put in enough effort and work to show that you really are who you say you are. And when you signal that by showing the dedication and the work, then the recipient of that information says, that guy was willing to go to get a, an MBA for two years, try and get his CFA completed. He's clearly an engineer, 
but he's spent a tremendous amount of time trying to tell me that he wants to be in finance come hell or high, high water. And that's where I was at the end of my MBA career as I was looking for my jobs. And I mean, in two years, I went from some knucklehead trying to get into finance and being told you have to sell insurance or sell stocks by smile and dial to somebody who's like, wow, this guy's serious about it. So if you really are serious and you want to spend two years and a lot of money in an MBA program, you will signal without a doubt that whatever you're focused on is what you want to do for your career. It doesn't mean you have to do that for the rest of your life, but it's a very, very strong signal. And people who need that signal know how to receive it, and it's important. Um, Can I just, I, just wanna, yeah. mm -hmm. I feel like we're talking a lot about non-engineering. I, I just want to say, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I think the best possible undergraduate degree anybody can get is an engineering degree. Yeah. Because you learn, and I use, I use so much still. I mean, I'm, I'm not doing um, Lagrange multipliers. I don't know if any of you guys know what those are. Um, I don't, but I did at one time. I'm not using any of that, but just the way of approaching problems, having a, like, a level of curiosity to really want to know the answer, knowing how to get that, being able to collaborate with other people on complex tasks, like all that stuff is fantastic no matter what you want to do. And I, so I, I don't, I feel like we're kind of discouraging about engineering. And I, I just want to make sure that I say that, that I, I am so glad. One thing I definitely wouldn't change is going back and getting a different degree other than an engineering degree undergrad. It was, it was awesome for me. Yeah, I, I certainly, well, as I said at the outset, you know, in, in the Master of Finance program, we love engineering undergraduates. We actually have special scholarships for you. Uh, by the way, we killed it at business school because when we got there, we were run, we could run circles around people yeah, with other you, degrees. You came in with technical skills we, that the poets and dancers didn't have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So stick with engineering. Don't quit engineering. It's uh, it's a really great um, thing to learn. Really great. Yeah, it's a it's a great combination. As the dean said, great combination to to have this cross disciplinary experience and take your technical skills into a new field like finance. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to check on some questions and see what we have coming through. Uh, I have more questions, but uh, this isn't all about uh, my questions, so let's see what we have. And uh, all right, here we go. What has been your greatest lesson learned from working in the finance investment field? So this time, Greg, we'll start with you. Lesson learned. Um, a lot of it is about how to manage your emotions. So investing is a very emotional um, experience. It's really scary. Some people, I think, are not capable of doing it because it, it, it's like it's it's all well and good to do a bunch of research and think that's the answer, but then when you actually have to write a check, like you're you're really betting, uh, and it's really scary to lose, particularly lose other people's money or, or to lose your own money. So. I think the thing that I, has been the most surprising to me is how big a factor emotion, emotional uh, things are in the investment decision-making process. And so I, I spend a lot of time, I, I meditate, I study mindfulness, I study um, behavioral finance, and you know, think about all the cognitive things that get in our way of making good decisions. I'm re I really try to be conscious of those things. That's been a big surprise to me. I'm not sure it's the best answer, but that's... Yeah, that's a good answer. Can I hear the question again? For specific, I just want to hear the wording again. What was the funniest thing that happened to you in college? Yeah, yeah. the great, greatest, <laughs> greatest lesson. <laughs> the greatest lesson learned from working in the finance field. Yeah, so it's going to be a similar answer, but I'm going to tell you a personal story that happened to me. Um, I, I made a trade error that cost me enough for a brand new car. And I'm, uh, that's a the truth. A Toyota or a Lamborghini? Well, <laughs> more, like the, more like the car you were driving today. You should have seen this thing, but that's another matter. That's beautiful. A, yeah. Um, it's, it's rented, though, rental. so that tells you everything you need to car. know. But uh, <laughs> it, 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 it was a very, 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 very painful experience to one day go to sleep, the next morning wake up and find out that I had basically thrown a brand new car down a garbage dump. And it was, it was my money. I mean, I was on the hook for most of it. We had a little insurance and stuff. And, and that was part of the deal. I mean, it, big risk, big return. But it was stupid. It was, it was a horribly dumb mistake. And it all, beca it all came down to I was preparing a trade, and a client just popped in, and I wasn't expecting him, and I pushed the button to make the trade, and by the time he left my office, I'd forgotten I'd done it. And the next morning, people in my office were saying, 
you, you just, you just, you know, you've got a trade on for like seven million bucks. And I said, Ugh, you're joking, right? They said, no, 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 I'm serious. Well, when it was done, I would love to have the tape of me on the phone calling Schwab as our custodian, they hold the money. I was, I was saying things like, oh my God, please get me out of this trade right now. And it was, it was emotional, it was horrible. And you know, all I'm saying is sometimes when, the, when you're dealing with, you know, we dealt with billions of dollars for clients' money. When you're dealing with billions of dollars, one little zero or two little zeros can make a big difference. So anyhow. So count your zeros? That's the like, Yeah, so if you can count to zero, your you're going to be good at this job. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's, no it's, how many zeros. Yeah. Yeah, that's the so that's a personal answer, but it's, it's, it's probably the most poignant experience I ever had of pain and suffering in the moment. But the 2007, 2008, 2009 were excru excruciatingly painful, and it just never ended. And it was worse the next day, and the next day, and the next day. I ended up having, I'm telling you more than you're asking for, but I cracked a tooth, my jaw was sore, I was irritable. My wife would say, what's wrong with you? I said, I have no idea, but whatever it is, it's bad. And it was, it was very, very stressful. I didn't freak out. I didn't kill myself or anything. But it was, it was almost three years, well, two almost exactly years of excruciating pain. And it was, you didn't even know it was happening because it was such a slow burn. And it got worse and worse and worse. And then when it all came back, you know, it, it took a long time for people to believe that the world wasn't going to end. So after the burning was over, you didn't know if you were still on fire or not. It was so, it was painful. So those are two answers. I think this is one of the lessons, that's a great answer. One of the lessons why experience really matters, and that's been said a couple of times here, because people we hired at BlackRock who came in after the financial crisis, the only world they knew was zero interest rates and uh, this craziness. And, you know, they were trying, I was in a quantitative, I led quantitative modeling teams, and they were trying to build models for this world. And I'd say, this is not the normal, you know, this isn't normal, this is extremely exceptional. It's lasted a long time, but... I think that's why you learn things on the, I also had a boss, uh, who, a guy who I reported to who said, don't ever hire a cheap portfolio manager for exactly the reason you said. These have to be really super smart people because get the, in the wrong decimal place and we're talking about huge amounts of money. So no cheap portfolio managers, only super smart guys managing money. And you know, I think that's uh, a very good lesson. Okay, next question. Ah, what's the value of an MBA in the current job market? Is it really about the network, and is there value in getting one outside of the top schools? Do you care if someone, you've already said you, an MBA certification is important, so I guess that means, yeah, it still matters. How would you answer this, student? I, I, th I would say, this might probably be the least best answer when you get to give on a panel, but it really depends. So I know for me, because it's very costly to go get an MBA. It's two years out of a job, so you don't have any income. Schools are expensive, 70000 a year. Um, so the opportunity cost is really high to go, to go get an MBA. For me, um, and, and as you heard for Paul, it, it was really an opportunity to make ourselves a totally different candidate for jobs than we were before we got it. But that's not always true. Uh, and I think it really depends on what you want to do. But it's, it's, a, it's a costly decision. I, I wanted to do it because I wanted to take a different path, and I thought I needed the, I thought I needed the credential, and I thought I needed the the education, and I and I thought I needed the network. You know, I didn't really know people who could help me get those kinds of jobs, and I I went to Wharton and I met them. Um, so that's part of the question. The other part was about the, you know, does it matter what school you go to? I, it it matters for sure, um, but. Times have changed a lot, and it used to be there was Harvard and Stanford, and Wharton thought they were like one of those two or three, but they weren't really. But, but it, you know, they're, they're like a couple really elite schools. Now I think that the caliber of other schools, I'm sure Rady too, is so high that, that there's, there's a lot of value, I think, if you really want to change the direction of your career and getting an MBA from, I mean, there's some bar where it, I, th I don't think it's that helpful. But I, I, think it's, I think it's valuable. But it's costly. It's a very costly decision that needs to be carefully considered. Paul, do you want to comment? Yeah, I agree. So the cost issue, I, I'll just, just give you a sense of whatever you earn for your first year in normal work, then the second year of normal work, you add those two together, and that let's just say that's 50,000 twice, so there's 100 grand. Then you add 70,000, 70,000, you're up to 240 grand, 250 grand. If you make 100,000 a year, you know, you're well over whatever 
you know, you've got $340,000 of cost. And, and if it doesn't benefit you career-wise, you've lost two years of progressing on a career. So it's, right. a, it's a very big decision. Right. So when you think about that, the, to me, the answer is, for me, it was essential. It was absolutely, there was no way in the world I was going to get to do what I wanted to do, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in stocks and bonds. I didn't know all the nuances of Corp Fin and all the other stuff. But the point was, I knew I couldn't do what I wanted to do with what I had. And for me, there was no question I was going to study like crazy on the GMAT, apply to all the schools that I felt would be good for what I wanted to do, and just hope for the best, and then pick up my roots and move, right? So I went to Philadelphia. He did too, obviously. My wife was a, is a doctor, was working as a doctor. For the first seven months, she stayed here, and we, were, we didn't have kids yet, but I was over there. So, so like, you know, married couple, living in two different places. She came over to work at the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania for the last, like, 14, 15 months. We spent some time in Baltimore, et cetera. And I, I don't know if I told these, this crowd here. Um, I'll say it to, to, it's kind of getting off track, but my wife came out with me to T. Rowe Price, where they're based in Baltimore. And where I lived was really a bad place in Baltimore. Baltimore's nice if you go to Camden Yards, but if you lived where I lived, you'd be thinking, why would anybody live there? My wife came out to visit one time. She goes, why would anybody live there, including you? And I said, what are you saying? She goes, if these people are so smart that you're dealing with, why do they live in Baltimore? Why don't we live in San Diego? And I kind of talked about that before. And at that moment, I said, you're right, sweetie. This is where we're going we're to focus on us and what we want to do, and we're going to make it happen our way. Uh, so that's a sideline. But the MBA is very important if you want to totally make over your career. If you think you're going to get a raise of 10 grand, that's not a reason. If, you, if you're, you know, if you're already working someplace and your company wants you to add credentials, probably staying local and working there is a very good choice, right? So it kind of, it, it really is a depends answer. But if you know you want to totally change your life and you want to move and do all that kind of stuff, that's one choice. Another is stay local, keep working, and another is stay local and focus on it and get it done. Uh, but uh, to, me, the, 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 to me, the quintessential answer to that question is if you absolutely want to change your life, Yes, it's worth it. I just add one other thing. It you you should um, if your if your aspiration is to work to have Goldman Sachs come in and hire you out of business school. Th there's a pretty small number of business schools that you probably should go to. If your aspiration is you want to do like what Paul said, I, I want to get out of the path that I'm in and I want to do something different. Look at what kinds of companies you might want to go work for. Do they recruit at business school? You know, do do some work to figure out you know, what kinds of graduates from what kinds of schools work at that company. And, um, but, but there are, there are certain firms that only hire from a you know, small handful of, of business schools. No, that's very true. And also what's happening in business schools in recent years is there's been uh, big growth in specialty master's programs. The MBA was always the classic business school sure. program, two year program. Some of them required business experience, others didn't. But now there's been this explosion of growth in specialty master's programs like the Master of Finance program. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we're at capacity, 140 students. I mean, it's, it's great. One-year program, it's expensive also. One-year program, though, and Master of Business Analytics programs, Masters of Accountancy programs. So there's been a lot of growth in these specialty one-year master's programs. But the bedrock of the business school has historically been the MBA. And for these flagship schools, of which Wharton is certainly one, you're too modest, Greg, but you know, the MBA is still, I think, the flagship program for, for these schools. Can I just say one other, one other thing? I, we're, we're spending a lot of time talking, like we come from an investment standpoint where we're dealing with people a lot and um, making investment decisions. There are so many careers in finance, like, there are people that design securities. There are people that pool securities together and design structures that people might want to invest in. There are people that create mutual fund products. There, there are just tons and tons of careers in, in finance. So don't think because you know, we're here talking about our, our specific thing that that's by any means um, the whole of finance. It's a humongous industry with all kinds of cool jobs. And, and since you got on that, one of the things that you might also not necessarily be thinking about, but General Electric traditionally had a big finance arm, and a lot of people who wanted to get into finance per se would go to GE and work up their career, and then they'd launch into the next sort of thing, like corporate finance, working at something like SDG, and E, uh, working at Intel, working at some of these big organizations that are constantly in the securities market, 
which is what Greg is talking about. If you need to, to get $5 billion worth of debt sold for Apple, you, you need to know what you're talking about, how to get it done, how to get it priced, who to sell it to, who's going to move it, right? Uh, in the olden days, not so much anymore. There's also a lot of analytical work where you're, you're analyzing markets, economics, you're analyzing uh, estimates of interest rates. Um, there's uh, you know, venture capital where you're basically putting small amounts of money in lots of little businesses hoping that one or two of them are going to work out and, well, and then you make you a hundred. Well, you hope yeah. they all do, but <laughs> if, if one of them makes you a hundred times your money and 50 blow it out to zero and the rest get your money back, you're ahead, obviously. The point is there, there are a lot of different roles other than just investment management in the finance world. And an MBA, if you choose that MBA, can lead you to those roles as well. And the other thing is ultimately, if you know you want to stay in San Diego, and you, if, if, if I had it to do over again, I'm not doing a sales job here, but if I knew I wanted to be in San Diego and I had not had that experience of going out there, seeing how bad Baltimore was and coming back, I, I thought I would end up in New York because that's where I thought the only place I would be. But as it, if I had said, you know, I'm never going to leave San Diego, I would seriously consider staying, you know, local um, because you don't have to uproot your family and yourself. Yeah. Well, here's a, a question that uh, you haven't directly touched on, but it's, I think it's a question that many a student has, has thought about. What advice would you give to students who don't know what field they want to go into? What would you say? That was me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just get good grades, get a good job, do a really good job at it. And, you know, over time, you'll, you'll start to learn what you like. And, um, you know, the Dean and I were, we were talking earlier about my, I always thought of my career as just trying to create as many options for myself as I could because I, I kind of, I didn't know what I wanted to do until like five years ago. Like, I finally feel like, okay, now this is where I'll finish my career where I am. But, I never knew what I wanted to do. So I, I was just taking the best opportunity that I could find and doing a really good job at that. And then other than you know, business school, which is a very conscious decision, it was just take it as it comes. So I, I don't stress out about it if you don't, want you, don't know what you want to do. But do really well at whatever you're doing. And, and you know, over, over your career, you'll build a reputation for yourself and opportunities will come along. And that's the best advice I can offer. Don't yeah. worry about it. Nobody knows what they want to do. Honestly, nobody knows. And people who do at your age, no offense, are idiots. Because who know, even knows what's going to be out there in 10 years? So you should not know what you want to do, I would say. That's my answer to that. Yeah. Well, yeah, and my thought, um, for me... Uh, and I take it back. If you do know, maybe you're right, and you're not an idiot. <laughs> but some of you who take it. I've got his phone number if you want to talk to him later. Uh, Sorry about that comment. Uh, I will, I will say that I was lucky because I knew almost exactly what I wanted to do like through my life. Um, and again, I, I told you I wanted to sort of be this international man of mystery, go off to Europe and spend my life there. But when I fell in love with stocks and bonds and investing, it was a sort of, it was, it was so clear that that's what I wanted to do, there was no mystery. So my answer to the question would be, if you have any inkling of what you're interested in, I would start reading broadly in that area. If, if you think to yourself, yeah, what are those guys talking about? That investment management sounded great. I'm going to start reading books. You know, go to the library and get books that are for the layman. You know, there's books called the, Still the Only Investment Guide You'll Ever Need. If you've never invested a penny of your own money or anybody else's, how do you know what it's like? Well, if you're, if you're really interested, you're going to start digging. And you need to be curious to start asking yourself, what am I good at? What do I like? How, how do I not worry about the money? Just what do I want to do, right? And then I think I always read books. I'm a total nerd. Um, I think if you want to learn about how trees grow, you go get a book on trees. If you want to learn about investments, you read a book on investments. If you want to learn about how to meet a girl, you do that, right? Uh, and so the, the point is simply- Are there I, books on that? There, there yeah. are books on that. I wrote it. You can see how it worked yeah. out. Right? <laughs> yeah. But, I, but I, I would say that it's a very, very, very typical problem that it's hard to know what you want if you've never done it. And so I would, I would, you know, I think if you do an inventory of your skills, I think if you do an inventory of things you do like and don't like, you know, you do a little T chart, like, hate, you know, you put all this stuff down here, and pretty soon you're going to notice that you do want to work in an office, you don't want to work in the hot sun, you do want to do this, you don't want to do that, you hate numbers, you love numbers. Um, once you've identified those things, you could say, how do I make a living doing this? And I, I will say. If you become a salesperson, selling tends to, uh, this, is a, this is another freebie, if your job is an expense center, you can be fired at any time 
and the firing process makes your business more profitable. If you bring in the business and you're in the sales role, you're bringing in business and you're bringing in revenue. When they fire you, they lose sales because people who buy from people like people. People didn't come to my office just to hang out with you know, some random person. They wanted to talk to Paul. And not that I'm all that great, but the people who went to see Elena wanted to see Elena. The people who went to see Brett wanted to see Brett. They, they were right over there. The point is, <laughs> when you have a connection with somebody and you're the salesperson who makes them want that solution or process or, or supply, whatever it is, if, if you've got the best valves in town and they know they're going to get the right valve on time with the correct specifications because they've dealt with you 15 times, they're going to buy from you all day long. And they, your boss won't fire you if you're good. So that's a freebie. I'm going to give a little bit more of a nuanced answer to, to the question. Um, this is advice I give. People come often, younger people come to my office and ask for career advice because I'm friends with their father or whatever. The, um, thinking about your next job, sh make sure you think about it as a two-way street. I find that a lot of um, younger people think about what do they want out of their next job. And that's all interesting, but the person who's going to hire you is doing the same thing. They're thinking about, what am I going to get? And so the more you th can think about what talents are you bringing and what are you able to do for whoever's going to hire you, and you can meet that with things that you want, you're going you're gonna to be much more fortunate in, in your next job. But so just so make, make sure you think about it two ways, and, and maybe one way of thinking about, if you don't know what you want to do, thinking about what you could do is, what am I good at? And, and who would value that? And maybe I'll just go do that and see how that goes. Uh, Thank you. Last question. So this, this was an interesting question, whoever submitted it. As good friends, did you influence each other's career paths? UCSD. There's an assumption Warden. in that question. He's, he's talking about, he's talking <laughs> about the word good. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Good. Yeah. I, I can clearly say that whatever Greg did is that's what I did. Well, if you look at the if you look at the timeline, you did sort of copy me. I copied him. I engineering. Oh, you yeah. then oh, did engineering. I followed in your path. That's true. Warden and six years Actually, later, Warden. I called I, him daddy sometimes. I think that <laughs> that just took a weird turn. Okay, sorry. Um, I I actually think we did not. I don't think so yeah, either. No, we really didn't. It was just a fluke. It was a total yeah, fluke. It really was just kind of random. Yeah, but I mean that being said, it's pretty. I mean, I think it's pretty cool. UCSD roommates. It is funny to see our like finance sitting here tonight. Yeah. Last night we had dinner together. My wife was there, and uh, he was saying, you know, is it possible that we kind of had this, you know, forty years, well, forty years later, well, I don't know, thirty-five years later, after sitting around in uh, Argo Hall, that we'd be sitting here tonight talking about what we're talking about? It's bizarre. Yeah. But yeah. that's you know that's just like your comment earlier. You have no idea what's going to happen in your life. Don't cheat people. Be nice. Take care of people. Be nice, like Ellen says. Be nice to each other. Right. And then do, you know, do think about yourself as a product or a service that you can sell to somebody, because that's really what jobs are all about. And remember, you know, people are going to pay you as little as possible to make you do that job if you're willing to accept that amount. And if you realize that you're worth more than that, you either demand more or you move on. So if you haven't worked for a living yet, there's one other thing I'll add. If you haven't worked for a living yet, you don't have to worry about all these nuances, but I would suggest studying you know, business books, hiring books. Pretend you're the president of a company and pick up a book that a president of a company would read. Like, if, if, you, if, if Greg goes to a book, you know, shop, and he says, what do I need to le learn about today? I mostly read comic books. So That's you know, true. Just okay. so you know. But he, he's going to be thinking about how do I bring more, you know, horsepower to my company? He's not, he's not going to... He's going to be thinking about what he can do to hire the next person. What are the skills? What's the new business? All so you need to think in the, you, you really do need to think in the mind of the person who's going to hire me, what do they want? And that was great advice from Greg, in my opinion. One other thing I would say, if you do an MBA, I would recommend very, very strongly that you work. I would recommend you work at least two or three years professionally before you go off to an MBA. Because if you don't, you're kind of spinning your wheels. And if, if, if it's about a finance job where you're going to be in front of a client, being older is not a bad thing. Being 28, 29, 30 is not a bad thing. If, however, you want to stay at your company and get more kudos and more pay, then getting an MBA right away isn't a bad idea. But that's a different career. That's not the career switch that we talked about. Um, but it's, again, that's, that's why you do different choices with your MBA decision. You know, we're out of time, but this has been wonderful, and it's so wonderful for you guys to come back home to UCSD so where it all started. Such a great day. 
Thank and you for coming, by the way, everybody. I yeah. really appreciate it. So thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you, too, for being here. We're all here because of you, too, and we appreciate it greatly. I thought thank it was you. the free food. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody.